so we have some acorn squash here and it's so hard you about need a hatchet or an axe to get into it uh, then we have this is a New England pie pumpkin uh, which is an heirloom variety well both of these are heirloom varieties um, and uh, anyway we're gonna just do a little educational video on how you and your children can open these in a safe way that's easy uh, <clears throat> so some people may take a knife and work really hard to open these up um, but uh, a really easy way to do it is to use a baton so here you take the baton so I'm holding the knife here and try to hit it about right there all right good all right so we open that one up all right Chesney would you like to try All right, beautiful. That looks good. All right. Now, next step is that we uh, will grab a spoon. We'll just take and uh, we'll scoop out the seeds, and later we'll sprinkle a little bit of salt on them, and then we'll put these in the oven and ro and dry them out, and then roast them just a little bit. The seeds are very nutritious. That's how we do it. So now I'll give you girls a turn. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I see a little bad spot here. These were out and frosted quite a bit, and so they had a little bit of frost damage. So I'll just cut that little bad spot out yeah these these acorn squash are quite a bit more tough and hard to chop than the uh, other kind of pumpkin All right. and we'll spread that out a little bit where it can dry I like to cut them not much thicker than that and then just lay them out what would be the advantage of baking versus boiling them when you bake them it kind of concentrates the sweetness more so you'll have a little bit more of a, a sweeter flavor and it'll be a little bit drier because you have to add a little, have to add a little bit of water in order to cook it, versus baking, you bake it dry. The girls are doing a nice job there. That looks good. You girls want to try a, your hand at cutting these into slivers. Mm -hmm. All right, so. And you want to hold it stable with your left hand and then you'll have to push it's a little bit of a challenge but I believe you're up for the challenge go ahead you want Chesney to smash it for you Chesney you, you, here you hold the knife steady hit it right there there you go. Good job. Yeah. Yep. Good teamwork there. All right. Do that again. Maybe we should do it this way. There you go. Okay, go ahead, Chesney. All right. So now that we have it, and then let's split that one down in the middle. Yep, there you go. All right. Yep. Uh, this is a safer method for inexperienced ones. And it's fun. It's, it's good teamwork. Mm -hmm. Instead of competing against each other in sports, 
we can work together for the same goal. Okay, uh, Rebecca, do you want to take a turn at it? You can turn it over if you want. Yeah, look at those muscles. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost as funny. I don't want to mess with you girls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, either, either this, either this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want them ganging up on me. <laughs> I like this method because the, all the fingers are out of the way. Yes, I agree. It's a lot safer. <laughs> all right. Well, are y'all ready to put it in the oven? All right. Uh, okay, so uh, one of you can open the oven. Somebody who wants to open the oven. Go ahead, Rachel. All right, good job. All right, next time, instead of letting it drop like that, just hold on to it and just let it come down and it'll be a little more quiet. All right, and then one of you can put that in the oven. When you're cooking with a, a wood cook stove like this, um, oftentimes, the whatever you have on this third of the pan that's closest to the firebox, whatever is closest to the firebox, this third will generally get baked sooner than this other side. And so you'll you'll watch it and you'll see, oh, okay, these are kind of getting browned and these ones here aren't quite so baked. And so sometimes you'll take it out and you'll flip it around like that and then that makes it evenly bake. Uh, and then most wood cook stoves that have an oven have this. So this damper, when the damper is out, then the smoke will go just directly from the firebox and it goes across there and it goes up the pipe. But this damper here, if you push it in, it forces the smoke to go over the top here down the side around here underneath the oven and then out the pipe and so uh you don't have in order to bake you don't have to push this damper in i've baked without the damper being in um but uh if you're wanting to bake things faster it's a good idea to push this in and that forces the heat to go around the box around the oven box. Does the pumpkin become more sweet after it goes through the heat? Yes. So in our life, sometimes God allows us to go through fiery trials, like the fiery oven. And when we go through those fiery trials, it develops a sweetness in us that we wouldn't have otherwise. So rather than running away from trials, rather than complaining when trials come, let us see these trials as something that God has sent to make us sweeter. Something that God has given to benefit us. We can complain in the trial and we can try to run away from the tri trial or we can embrace the heat and we can say, Father in heaven, I know that you have allowed this trial to come into my life to develop something good in me. What will we do? Will we complain and run away from the trial? Or will we embrace the heat of the trial? Let us embrace it with God's strength. Why do you use Himalayan salt over regular salt? Okay. Uh, so the regular salt, it's bleached white. Mm -hmm. And it's unnatural. So nowadays we have refined sugars, we have refined oils, and now we have refined air, like air conditioners, you know, uh, and then we have refined salt. And so 
when they bleach that salt, it's no good. It's not good. It's just like like white flour when they bleach it, you know. Um, so like the Redmond salt is like from Utah, and it's just a naturally mined salt. That's excellent. It has so many different trace minerals in it. So all the minerals have been refined out of the white salt. Yeah. And that Redmond salt, like I'll feed it to my horses, then I use the manure on my land in my garden, and then eventually whatever salt that I'm feeding the horses goes back to the land. Um, there's an organic farmer here that, uh, before they moved to Tennessee, he would take, um, it's called C90, it's a sea salt that has 90 different trace minerals in it, and he would do that as a foliar spray on his produce. And then he would test it and find that the bricks or the sugar level was higher in his produce. So the higher your bricks test is or your, your sugars in it, the, the better shelf life you'll have. So how did you learn all this, Titus? Um, well, my parents taught me a lot. I've read a lot of books. I went to a medical missionary school in Wildwood, Georgia, and people would come with... Uh, diabetes, heart disease, uh, cancer, and they'd be taking a lot of pharmaceuticals and we would help them to get on a plant-based diet, help them to uh, stop drinking cancer in a can, Coca-Cola, stop, you know, we'd help them get, go hiking, uh, try to encourage them to trust in the Lord for their healing, and then uh, try to encourage them if they had bitterness in their life to let that go and um, have emotional healing, you know, mental healing. And then, uh, like, a, a good percentage, you know, 80, 90, 95% of the people that actually stayed with the program could go home not, n not needing their pharmaceutical drugs anymore uh, with their diabetes reversed, their cancer reversed. I worked with a medical missionary that was a neighbor of mine, a very, very, very well-studied woman. And uh, a lady came to her with breast cancer. And this woman was uh, at her place for, I think, a couple months. And just went on a plant-based diet, really embraced the whole program, trusting in the Lord. And then she went back to her doctor and did some tests. And the doctor said, you don't have any more cancer. It's gone. Um, so I've, I've seen it with my own eyes uh, what and the Lord designed us for our body to heal ourselves absolutely yes yes uh, the Bible speaks of the tree of life and it says the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations so these herbs these things are for our healing and sometimes people ask me well what herb should I take for this what your herb should I take for that? People want a magic herb. It starts with changing your diet. Mm -hmm. Herbs are good, but you really, really need to start with changing your diet. And cut out the bad herbs. Right. Cut out the poisonous herbs like tobacco, marijuana. Uh, you know, cut out, cut out the, the things in your, in your diet that you know are poisons, alcohol. Cut those out. And then, yes, seek out the herbs. These pumpkin seeds are good. They have a, essential amino acids which are good for your brain. And they're also anti-parasitic. So if you have some parasites, it'll help kind of deter them. Now the pumpkin seeds that you usually see in the store that you buy have the, the hole removed. These have the hole. So they're a little bit more crunchy, but they're good. They're real good. So do you eat the whole thing? Yes. I like to, once they're roasted, I like to get some maple syrup or some honey and drizzle it on and then eat it that way. And, oh, it's good. It's good. It's real good. <laughs> I tried it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very it's, good. Yeah, it's real good. So what about nuts and stuff? They're good for you. As long as you don't eat fried ones. Yeah. Now, some of these peanuts and things or some of these nuts, they fry them in oil and they got a bunch of salt in them. Olive oil. You know, we ate olive oil just poured over our soup today, mm -hmm. drizzled over our soup. Mm -hmm. 
but you say don't fry with olive oil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, olive oil, and the cold press olive oil is good for you, uh, but a lot of people like to fry with it. And when you take that oil and you fry with it, it changes it from being something healthy for you to being harmful. From oil to grease. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think are some things that are good for um, digestive, digestion? You know, like a lot of people have digestive problems, like what are natural things that... The main, the main thing with digestive issues it, to start with is spacing your meals five hours apart with nothing in between. So if, if you have your washing machine, it goes through a cycle and you put your clothes in there and it's what a 40 minute cycle. If it's almost at the end of its cycle and then you put some dirty socks in there, in order to get those socks clean, it has to start a whole new cycle. And so you'll have double the working time of the machine in order to get everything clean. Whereas if you waited until the one cycle was over and then you waited until you had another batch of dirty clothes, you would wash more clothes with less energy consumed. And so it's the same way with your stomach. It, your stomach has a cycle. So if you eat uh, like a raw apple, it's in your stomach for about 30, 40 minutes and it's in and it's out of your stomach. So it doesn't take a lot of time for your stomach to digest it. Uh, but things like cheese can stay in there for over 15 hours and cheese is already rotten to begin with and it's a hard fat and so if all the anybody was everybody should stop eating cheese but especially if you have digestive issues cut the cheese out completely no cheese uh, and so space the five hours and then the other thing that's important is when you drink your water or your liquids a lot of people eat too fast they don't chew enough and then the food is kind of dry because they didn't chew it long enough to mix the saliva with it. So then they wash it down with some kind of drink, water or some kind of drink. Um, what that does is that dilutes the stomach acid. And so because the stomach acid is diluted, the stomach has to work harder to produce more acid, which makes a tired stomach. When you have a tired stomach, you have a tired mind. When you have a tired mind, you have a tired body. So it's an overworked stomach. So you work against your stomach when you are drinking with your, your meals. You need six cups a day on average to stay alive. You need eight cups a day to feel great and you really need 10 cups a day to rejuvenate. And so if you drink your water about, like the fir first thing that I do, I try to make it a habit. First thing I do when I wake up is drink four, four cups of water. And then that gets my bowels moving right to begin with. And then you just clean out the very, very beginning of the day. And then you're well hydrated uh, and it, it, it just, you start your day off right. But you want to have a half hour space between when you drink your water or whatever you're drinking and when you eat so you don't dilute your stomach acid. Then when you eat, don't drink anything until an hour after you have eaten. So if you have that spacing, you're working with the laws of physiology. But if, if you're not spacing it in that way, you're working against the physiology and how your stomach works. So two of my volunteers so far, that have, one of the volunteers was here for like two weeks, the other volunteer has been here for about one week. And both of them told me, uh, after I've been here, Titus, my um, acid reflux is gone. So they're not drinking with their meals like they were before and they're on a plant-based diet they're not eating cheese they're not drinking coffee um, and another thing with digestive issues is really spicy hot food it's not it's hard hard on your stomach so especially especially if a person's having stomach issues so i would say something to your followers um uh, coming here you know um Titus is in very good shape. 
He's very thin and slim and trim and very he's strong. Very, very healthy. Very healthy, very strong. Yeah. Uh, if you come to help, you're going to be busy all day. <laughs> he don't stop. And from daylight <laughs> to dark, he might eat one meal a day. You're not going to drink no water while you're here. <laughs> uh, he sent me up the mountain to log logs today and delim them. And he threw me a bottle of water, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, if you do come to help, and uh, yeah, what advice do you have for the people that uh, are going to come and and help? Uh, Speaking from experience, I would say you need to be a worker. Don't come here just to um, play. Be serious about your relationship with the Lord. What you see here is real. Um. What you've seen with Peter's real. Um, the food is very flavorful. Try it. It's good to try it. Um, but be willing to work and uh, and talk about Jesus all day. Titus is constantly singing songs all day. Uh, man full of joy. Uh, but he's very serious too. Um, there's not a lot of playtime, uh, but he takes time with the kids every single day. So I try to. There's... I would definitely say he's very patient with your children, and uh, if your kids come with you, they will have fun. Yeah, we do have fun. Yeah, I would definitely, uh, that's what I would have to say. All right, okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Yeah. A word a word from the man with some experience. Yeah. I. Yeah. I appreciate Brother Charles and his wife Renee. They have worked hard. Mm -hmm. They have worked hard. And I really, I really appreciate that. And, you know, you put in time here building this up, and you don't know all the people that will come later and benefit from those trees that you trimmed up that we're going to cut and the lumber we're going to use right. to build, you know. Uh, and none of us really know, you know. You, you do a kind deed. You don't know the influence of that. You speak a lie or you, you do something unkind. You don't know how far that will go. You don't know the influence of that. You know, um, There was a missionary who went to Africa and his goal was to tell the people about Jesus. And he, they just wouldn't listen to him. And he just, so he got discouraged and he went home and uh, he doubted and he said, you know, I wasted my life over there for what, you know, nothing, no good ever came of it. And then later his daughter went back to Africa and there was a man that approached her and says, do you remember me? And she's like, no, I don't. And he's like, well, I, I was the one that delivered eggs to your door. Uh, every day I delivered eggs except for on Sunday. And your dad told me about Jesus and he showed he showed me a better way. And I stopped living in fear of the spirits. I stopped worshiping the false gods. And I came to know Jesus right. as my Savior. And so she went back. She told her dad, you, you're, it wasn't wasted. But he felt like it was wasted. So do what God has called you to do. Grow where you're planted. You know, if you're a mother, train your children for the Lord. If you're a father... Train your children for the Lord. That's your first responsibility. That's your first calling. And then God may give you something more, something else, some other ministry. But, uh, yes. You know, I would say this too. Um, and a lot of folks listening would probably agree with this, but if we're waiting for people to walk in a church, it's probably not going to happen. Um the Lord is moving in people's lives by watching these videos and they want to find something that's real that's not fake that's real this is real this is how Jesus worked with the seeds and the vegetables and the yes. farming and the horses and the, the building the framing the carpenter work yes um, yeah he worked you yeah. know he he died at 33. And for the first 30 years of his life, you know, he, well, you see little Amish boys 
at five years old right. with a hammer yeah. helping build the barn, you know. And so I can see Jesus in the carpenter shop doing something to help at four, right. five years old. Right. And so for, uh, you know, like 25 years, he was working in the carpenter shop or, you know, in the field or, you know, and we don't know a lot about exactly how that that, uh, that was, but he was doing his father's will right. when he was doing that. And when he told the parable about the sower went to sow, you know, as he was telling the story, people could see, oh, there's a farmer, he's broadcasting the seed. Right. They could see that. And so people who don't live on a farm, they don't have a garden, it's really hard for them to understand these concepts because the, the, the Bible is written by men who are farmers, right. who work with their hands. And so that's what, one of the things I'm excited about is people are coming here, they're wanting to learn from nature. Nature is a book we can learn from. They're wanting to learn. So as we learn to garden, as we learn to farm, it will open up our eyes to see what the Scripture is really talking about. Right. And teaching the kids. And I didn't grow up with horse and buggy. I didn't grow up farming with horses. So when I read about Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, I didn't know what a yoke was. I had no right. clue. you know. But then I started working with Amish people that took the time to teach me. And I'm like, Oh, okay, here's a yoke. Yeah, we use a yoke every day to, to, to you know, yoke up two horses together so right. they can pull the load. And so it, it, I was able to see so much more in Scripture after starting to work on a farm. Yeah, and Titus really does not have a car. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a little buggy and a little horse named Picasso. He goes to the store. Picasso is not mine. He's in Rachel's. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, but he does he does serve me pretty well. And I also, I have here in this area, I have the uh, OPC transportation system. <laughs> OPC stands for other people's cars. Yeah. So I mean, I ride with a lot of different yeah. a lot yeah. of different people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. That's good. You know, I planted some uh, winter mix on my garden. I like a cover crop? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there in my recliner looking out the window and I seen these crows land devouring the seed. You know, mm. There's the there's the gospel right in front of you yeah. and it's really happening. Yes. That's really so Jesus even made reference to them things. Yes. So that's how true they are in our life. Yes. You know. Yes. Plant the word of God in your mind by reading the word, by asking for the Spirit to speak to you through the word. And be careful because just like those crows will try to pluck that out mm -hmm. when it's just young and tender. Mm -hmm. In the same way, Satan will try. And I've seen it like when we're having a Bible study here sometimes. Like normally you can hear the whistle for the sorghum mill just very faintly. We were having a Bible study and we were on a very important topic. And all of a sudden that whistle was so loud that people were like, what's that? Yeah. It was so loud. Satan will try. He can't stop the Word of God from being taught or preached, but he does cause distraction. Right. I've seen it over and over. Don't let that phone distract you. You know, Put that phone away and get a paper copy of God's Word because if you have the Bible on your phone, ding, 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 you'll get a text. You know, that's one reason why my phone is out there in the shed. In the shed. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, that's because awesome. if I was yeah. studying my Bible and my my phone was right here, I'd be tempted to check and see, ooh, who is that? You know, yes. what, what what is that? What do they want? You know. Well, you, um, well, however much time you spend with God, the more you put into it, the more God will give you too. Is it, is it, is my experience when I haven't read my Bible or I haven't prayed or haven't sang them hymns in my heart. Mm-hmm then God's waiting on me. Yeah, you know? yeah the, the days where I think, oh, well, I'm, I need to go spend some time with the Lord this morning, but you know, I have all this work to do. I'll just do that later in the day. Right. I'll block it, or maybe I'll do it this evening. Then later never comes. Right. If you don't put Him first in the morning, oftentimes you just... And it's kind of like you know Jesus was traveling with His Father and His Mother, and then uh, they lost track of Him. Right. And they search for him for three days. So if you lose that connection with Jesus, uh, sometimes it's three days before you really 
connect again. Right. It, and the, my, my worst days where I get frustrated at my horses and I get irritated with this person, I get stressed about that, those are the days where I just don't make time for God in the morning. You know, we were walking out of your gate here and the uh, other people had their horse and buggy here and the horses have blinders on yes. their eyes mm -hmm. and we walked by through that straight gate with them blinders mm -hmm. on. You know, think about that mm -hmm. with the Word. Yes. Yes, the, with the blinders, they can see some, but it keeps them from being distracted by looking behind them or to the side. And it, yes, we need to ask our Father in Heaven to give us some blinders so that we're not distracted by all the things. Right. The blinders kind of kind of help a horse can just go straight on, just not be distracted. You know, so many distractions. And Father in Heaven, please give us blinders. Yeah. You know. <laughs> And, and, you know, as men were tempted to lust, you know, Job said, uh, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I look upon a maid? You know, we need to just, in God's, ask for God to help us to know when to just shut our eyes or when to turn our head or when to look the other way. Because uh, if we sit there like King David did and watch, then we'll end up making the same sin as he did. You know, we got to... We need God's wisdom as men to know when to t close our eyes or turn our head or go somewhere else. You know, the um, Bible says, flee from temptation. To flee is to run. Mm -hmm. Let's run like Joseph. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes as Christians, we crawl away from temptation, kind of hoping that maybe it will mm -hmm. catch up with us. You know, um, if sin is, can't take fire into your your chest and not be burned something else i want to say is so when the world met you you were in your happy little habitat and and it's so easy anybody listening that's in ministry the the cares of the world will bog you down people pulling on titus they're just pulling he's on real him. he's a real guy but the ministry can bog him down and we don't want him to lose his vision. Like, he, like don't expect all this to happen overnight mm -hmm. just because people volunteered mm -hmm. and people donated. Because mm -hmm. that's a lot of weight on Titus, you know. Was he really ready for that? Maybe not. <laughs> but you know, God's teaching him mm -hmm. as he's going. He's growing. Um, his vision's strong. But... Um, you know, let's keep him in prayer um, because the devil's definitely here and wearing on him. Mm. And, and I'm telling you, the man don't stop all week long until Sabbath. And uh, Oh, Sabbath is such a wonderful yeah. day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, but yeah. you know what I'm saying. I yeah. mean, it, yeah. it's a lot of weight yeah. hearing of all the problems and hearing yeah. what all you need to do. And, mm. and, and God gave you the vision. So we need to stand behind you and pray for you, and keep you in prayer. And hold me accountable. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you see something in the Word, and you see I'm not following it, say, Titus, here's what the Word says. You're doing something different. You know, uh, we, you know, we need that. We, As brothers and sisters, we need to hold each other accountable. Yeah, it is hard for me. Uh, like this morning, uh, we had some volunteers come, and I said, okay, let's... let's uh, you know, open God's Word, sing together, you know, have some worship time. And Stephanie's like, you want me to record this? And I was like, no. I don't, right. You know, and then she's like, well, people really want, you know, they, they need this, they want this. I was like, okay. So we had our Bible study, and it was a good Bible study, and I felt the Spirit leading. Um, and then later she asked me, well, Titus, did I do something wrong? Like, am I pushing you, you know, and you, you know. And I said, no. I said, Stephanie, that's just... That's my selfish human nature. There's parts of me that wish that I never would have ever, you know, gone, been out on the internet because it's now it's just so many people coming, so much more responsibility. And sometimes I wish that I could just go back to the more quiet, the more peaceful, you know, uh, that I had before. But that's just that's just my human nature, right. you know. Um, I know that God's called me to this, and. I need people like Stephanie. I need people like you that are encouraging me uh, to let the light shine. You know, 
don't just close the light off into a, some dark room or don't take don't take the light off into the woods where only one person can benefit from its light but it was put, put the light out where lots of people can experience the light and the warmth of it it was good to see you take a break today though and just take the kids on a horse and buggy ride mm -hmm. cook with them mm -hmm. you know not performing the whole time you know because everybody's like hey what do you want to do here what do you want to do there that's pulling on you, mm -hmm. and you and you don't have that time to do what you're called to do and i really felt blessed because i had enough volunteers here that could work doing carpenter work that i could just tell the children hey come on let's go we're gonna we're gonna learn how to chop you know vegetables and i asked them i said who has never chopped an onion before and out of the group, one of them raised their hand. Right. Never chopped an onion before, you know. Well, you'll never learn any younger, you know. So I could, you know, what, what we cooked, it could, I could have done it in quite a bit less time if I would have just done it by myself or had maybe an adult help me, you know, one of, you know, Renee helped me, your wife or somebody else. But taking the time, investing the time to teach them, and it may take a lot of time to invest in teaching over and over, training over and over, but once they get it, then you, you can say, hey, uh, my son or my daughter, uh, let's cook lunch, you mm -hmm. know, and they can just go to it and do it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you've made that investment into their life. And then now they're not just dependent upon you. They're more independent and then they can help somebody else. And they can help you when you're sick or when, you, you, when you're not there for them, you know. Uh, so that's one of my goals. Is, and I thought it was amazing how God sent enough volunteers that I could just kind of, okay, you guys do the carpenter work, mm -hmm. and now, you know, uh, I can work with the children and teach them. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so we had some moms that were involved uh, as well with the children, and so, yeah, I, I felt really, I enjoy teaching. I feel very fulfilled when I'm able to teach some skills that God has given me. That's good. That's your calling. Well, looks like we've got some golden griddles. You girls, where are you girls at? Hello. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> They're up on the bunk beds. Don't get wrapped up in all this. Like, you, you, you are who you are. Don't lose that. That's what makes this. That's your calling. You know what I'm saying. Thank you. Yes. yes. Appreciate your... Yeah, and don't be afraid to take a break. Don't, Push. don't feel like you have to. You've already proved it. You don't have nothing to prove. Appreciate your encouragement. So.